you enjoyed your lunch. And uh, yeah, I, th I think very interesting talks that, are, that have been this morning. Some of them highlighting some of the problems we're facing and also some of them uh, touching on some of the solutions. So I, I sort of want to build on that and chat about something that, that I'm passionate about. Uh, as Prof mentioned, at, at the moment I'm working at Rand Merchant Bank and they welcome people with a, a different background um, and you're supposed to just be able to think for them. So on the banking note, I just wanted to first paint a, a bit of a picture for you about the world. If we have a look over there, we see the GDP growth percentages for emerging and developed worlds, as well as the blue line signif signifying that for the, for the globe. And over the past 10 years, what we've seen is, is there's a, a bit of a divergence go going where emerging markets are starting to pull ahead of the, those that are developed. If we drill down into that a little bit more and have a look at the, uh, the actual BRIC countries as well as Africa and their growth rates in relation to, to that of, of the United States and Europe, we see a significant trend uh, and great deal of, of positive growth well ahead of the US and Europe. Although Russia is actually lagging a little bit over here, when you consider that the population of BRIC accounts for almost 3 billion people in the world, if these nations are going to continue to develop at the rate that they're going and, and possibly increase in their growth going forward, uh, it's a great deal of growth. Now, this is sort of where the, the banking and, and the medis, medical side sort of join hands, is if we want to sustain this growth going forward and have growth rates of below or above 5%, uh, from the emerging markets, one of, th one of the important aspects is the cornerstones on which that growth is built, and those being health and education. Now, when we contrast what's happened in uh, the developed world's health and, and education systems, we've got a lot and, and a bit of a head start because we can, we can use that information and build on their, uh, their failures and their shortfalls. Now, going forward, looking at where we are in terms of our own health and our own education systems, as well as those of the BRIC countries, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And my feeling is that if we invest in these, we're going to be able to sustain growth, change the, the, the shift in power more towards the emerging countries, and actually have a, have a hand in, in changing history. So I've made a small punctuation change. Africa changed the world, because I think we can. And I think there's a lot of initiatives on the go at the moment that are, are sort of focusing on that. My only caveat to that is that we should do it one little step at a time. But if we're each working on one little aspect at a time, together we've got the momentum to make a, a great change. So this is where the heart valves come along. Um, and being something close to my heart, and I guess yours as well, uh, Heart valves are actually a very, very interesting aspect of the heart. Um, they, they perform a very basic function. All that they do is they allow the flow of blood to, to main, remain unidirectional. It's a really simple, simple thing to do, but when they don't do it, a lot of things go wrong. Now, I've just put up a picture of, um, of the basic anatomy and just focusing on, in on the red section, which is the, the sort of the higher stress section of the heart. Um, the left side of the heart contains the mitral and the aortic valve, and what those do are they're responsible to maintain the flow of blood into the rest of the body. Um, when they stop working, the flow of blood starts going backwards, and the entire body starts suffering because it doesn't have any oxygen. Now, the valves, particularly the, the, uh, the mitral valve, can become damaged in, uh, in a number of different ways the most common of which is an untreated strep throat. That then leads into rheumatic fever and then damage to the valve. In the developed world, the sort of main failure mode is, uh, is, is when there's a poor diet, there's calcification of the leaflets, and then the leaflets don't, don't act as well as they should. So, so they don't close or they don't open entirely. You get retrograde flow, the patients uh, have a, a shortness of breath, and then they have to have an operation. But in the developing world, this is typically happening in children. Now, um, when children have a strep throat leading to rheumatic fever, typically this goes untreated. But for the most part, the solutions that have been put in place are for the developed world. Uh, the West has looked at what the problems are 
and they've come up with solutions which seem elegant, but only if you contextualize them into the environment in which they're being placed. Sorry, can you just flip to the next one? So there's two types of heart valves which are commercially available. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have mechanical heart valves, which are very low profile. They're made typically out of pyrolytic carbon, which has the same density as blood. And on the right-hand side, you have tissue valves. Now, each of these are used for different indications and contraindications in patients. The mechanical valves have the advantage that they have a, a lifetime longer, typically, than the patient. They're made out of very solid material. When the surgeon implants them, they have very little risk of damaging that uh, that, that um, valve by using a needle, not pu you know, the, the needle doesn't cause any damage if they do happen to push it onto the leaflets. Um, but the downside is that the patient, because of the turbulence of the blood uh, that goes through that valve, then starts to clot. And clotting can lead to a stroke and an, or other thromboembolic event. So what patients have to do is that daily, they have to have uh, blood thinning medication. That obviously meaning that they have to fund it, and they have to be close to a medical facility that they can go and pick this up from. On the tissue side, typically it's made from either a, a pig or cow's heart covering, a pericardium, that's the tissue which is, which is used and it's treated so that when it's implanted into people, there's no immune response. Um, so it's not seen as a foreign object and the body doesn't act to try and get rid of that object. The downside of, of tissue valves, though, is when the surgeon is implanting it into a very small blind opening, the risk is very high that he can take his needle and prick it through one of the leaflets. The other downside is that because of the fatigue of a tissue, which has been in another animal before, there's a possibility that that then can, can start to tear or degrade. And after 10 to 15 years, the patient might need a, a reoperation. So if we look at those constraints, what we can do is rationalize a strong motivation for a valve in developing nations. Because typically we have individuals who are far from medical facilities and can't afford to fund themselves to have permanent ongoing um, medical treatment and anticoagulation. Um, also suiting not only the patient, but the surgeon is the expertise that they need and the experience that they might have to count on to implant this particular valve. And in developing nations, we often short not only of those skills, but also of all the apparatus that go together in theater. And with those limitations, it's, it's really forming one of the design criteria of coming up with a valve which suits a lot of the world. So this was my work for the last three years, condensed into five little pictures. Uh, and it's basically the, the sequential growth of, of a design iteration as, as technology has been released. So initially starting off, it was something turned on a four-axis uh, milling machine. And then slowly progressed. Uh, you'll see that it's a two-part frame. The, the, the upper and lower frame go together and sandwich a piece of pericardium in there to act as the leaflets. And as time went by and, and uh, new technology became available, something that, that was you know, slightly outside of the medical regime was a simple dentist sintering machine where they make very accurate bridges. So that machine was put into production. Custom code had to be developed to, to actually handle something like this. But then the actual uh, the, the design could be refined on that basis. So just zooming in on that final design, you'll see that it's got an upper and lower frame component. It's got a gap which is continuous along the perimeter that can sandwich any, any thickness of pericardium within a, a certain variance. And the biggest attraction and the most novel aspect of this design is the sewing ring. You would have seen on those two, two previous available uh, valves that they each have a sewing ring on the outside, and that's the material in which the surgeon uses to stitch that into the aortic root. In this design, what you can do is separate the, the assembly and the sewing ring. Seems pretty basic, but what that allows you to do is to work without risk in the opening of the aorta and stitch it into place. When, when the surgeon's happy that that's been done, you can take the assembly and simply click in the valve. If something does happen down the line where the, the tissue becomes uh, uh, um, damaged or 
starts to tear, and that comes through on an echocardiograph, it's really easy to perform a reoperation and simply unclick that assembly and, and fit a new one in. So then it was manufactured, which was very exciting for me. And you'll see on the bottom right over there is actually a fully designed uh, and working uh, valve with pericardium that came through from Namibia. So just to touch on those, um, it's got the locking mechanism. It offers a, sig a significant lifetime. Also for the blood, that all of the, the edges are, are free of, um, of sharp edges so that there's no turbulence in the blood. There's no possibility of having a, um, a clot created. Um, and it also comes from a, a methodology of, of manufacturing that's repeatable. One can use it uh, really cost effectively and produce on a mass scale. The next challenge of the project was actually to, to see how does this stack up against the ones that are commercially available. So a pulse duplicator and a fatigue test are something that you would do to, to compare and contrast uh, the, the functional parameters. So the retrograde flow, you'll measure the pressure drop across it, um, and the effective orifice area that you'll actually see in the valve. So not being able to count on um, a lot of American funding, uh, we had to make one. So on, on the right over there, you see what actually simulates the heart. So it's a, a server-controlled pump, which simulates the flows and pressures normally experienced in the body. Uh, there's a compliance chamber which uh, simulates capillaries, and in that you're able to see exactly how that, that valve functions. Um, all of the, the wiring over there is just to measure the pressures and the differences, the pressure recovery over the valve and so on. So expanding this now away from, from heart valves is to say, how can Africa change the world? And I, I sort of touched on a few, uh, few aspects. But to broaden them, I'd say, why don't we focus in on the problems that the, world, the rest of the world isn't experiencing? Um, we have a unique set of parameters here at the moment, and we often believe those to be a problem. But if we start looking at those as a unique opportunity to come up with solutions, we're not just satisfying our market. We, we're satisfying effectively the rest of the world. It's understood that our skills are currently limited. But what we can do is network together to knowledge share, to start working together and combining our efforts. We can see it's happening right across the globe with social media, and we can then start putting this into practice and then start working for Africa. Cost effectiveness is also most important, so that when, when it does get to commercial success, the rest of the world can take advantage of it. And through this, it's obviously, uh, I think, one of the, the first talks at lunch was to kind of emphasize that. Use the technology that's coming out. A lot of the times we don't know exactly where that technology is going to play a part, but if we start thinking a little bit differently, we're able to see where we've, where we've got technology, how can we fit that into a solution. So in conclusion, what I'd just like to say is that developing nations are standing up. Uh, a previous uh, speaker had pictures of, of unique South Africans that have contributed to, uh, to our history. And I think in the medical field, not only was the first heart, transpl heart transplant done here and the CAT scan created, but another, another uh, excuse me, a few other um, interesting aspects from South Africa w were contributed to the world. And for me, why I'm excited about it is I want to try and continue that legacy and see the first heart valve replacement tailored to this market happen right here. So Africa, I think we can change the world. We can do it one heart at a time. So I thank you for your time. If you'd like to get in touch with me, please email me. And uh, I've, I've really enjoyed speaking here today. Thank you.